Thank you, Richard. How many of you have turned your heat on this week? <laughs> Not quite, but I tell you, it's been a, it's been a beautiful week weather-wise. Nice and cool, blue sky, sunshine. Um, everything is still green, edging toward fall. But it's, it's been beautiful. You would almost think Satan was a, not alive and well, but he is. He's relentless, like a roaring lion roaming about. Don't let your guard down, folks, just because it's beautiful, clear, sunshine, cool. We would say almost perfect weather. Don't let your guard down. You know, in the wilderness, Jesus was tempted. And just as soon as Jesus was victorious in the first temptation, Satan came right back with another one. And when he was victorious in that one, he came right back with another one. He's relentless. So keep your guards up. Wear the armor. Pray, trust God. Well, good morning to you. It is Sunday morning. And... We're back together at Oak Grove Baptist Church. Not many, but that's not the issue, is it? You are here. We are here. Ask yourself some questions this morning. Am I of a serious mind about being here this morning? Ask yourself, is it important to you that you're here today? Is it really important to you that you're here today to worship, to fellowship? We've been doing some of that, hugging and greeting. And Is it important to you to be here today with brothers and sisters in Christ to fellowship together? Important to you to be here today to hear from God's word through its preaching of it. Ask yourself, am I seriously glad to be here this morning? Ask yourself, is there someone here today, perhaps, that needs a word of encouragement from you? Maybe there is. Uh, now, you know each other a lot better than Barbara and I know you, even though we've been here three, four weeks. You know each other. You know the challenges that you, some of you are going through. Maybe there's someone here today, as small a group as we are, someone that needs a word of encouragement for you. I know we're here to worship, but we're here to minister to each other as Richard has already implied in some of his comments. Maybe there's someone here today that needs you to pray for them. Be alert. Be sensitive to the needs of others. Is it in this an important time for you to be here this morning? I hope that your answer to these questions is yes, 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 and yes. As I was thinking about this morning, I was impressed that Barbara and I are sort of new to you. Um, I was impressed that I wanted to share just a, a Reader's Digest condensed, condensed version of my personal story. I was born and raised by Christian parents on a farm <clears throat> in southwest Alabama, Sumter County. Any of you have ever been to Sumter County? <laughs> uh, the county seat is Livingston, that's York, and there's a lot of smaller communities around. My, we had, we on, on a farm, uh, Christian parents, as I said. Uh, so obviously I was born and raised going to church. Now, um, in our little community, there was a, a Presbyterian church and a Baptist church. And being a few numbers, every, on first Sunday, everybody went to the Presbyterian church to worship. Second and fourth Sunday, we all went to the Baptist church. 
So I'm Baptyrian. <laughs> My mother played the piano for both churches. So I'm Baptyrian. Um, after my education in the county, elementary school, high school, college, which is now the University of West Alabama. Job brought me to Birmingham in 1960, and that's where I met Barbara on a blind date when she was a student nurse. Barbara's from Gadsden, and uh, the Lord brought her to West End. We used to be West End Hospital. There was a nurse's residence, and that's where I met her on a blind date. Uh, we'll soon celebrate our 60th wedding anniversary. Um, so it's been wonderful. Along the way, um, I, had to, I went to the dentist to get my teeth fixed, and I wound up getting my life fixed. My dentist was a Christian, and uh, I was struggling with the question of whether or not I was a really a believer. I was a church member active. And one day I asked him, I said, is it possible for a person to be sure that if he died, he'd go to heaven? And he said, well, Drew, um, what does Revelation 3.20 say? Now, we lived in a home with a grandmother who insisted on us memorizing scripture. So this is the verse of scripture I knew. And so I quoted it back to the dentist, Jesus in Revelation 3.20, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, opens the door, Jesus says, I will come into him. I will have fellowship with him and he with me. And uh, my dentist, his name was Sam. Sam said, Well, Drew, did Christ say if you'd open the door, did he say I might come in? I quoted the verse again. No, he said, If I open the door of my life, he says, I will. Now, Sam asked me again, did Christ say if you had opened the door of your life, did he say I'll probably come in? And I said, no, Sam. He says, I will come in. I knew enough about Jesus to know that he never lied. He always spoke the truth. He would always do exactly as he promised. And that day, sitting in the dentist chair, I became a Christian. How many people do you know who became a Christian in the dentist chair? <laughs> I know that's not the usual place, but that's where I was. And that day, assurance and certainty of salvation. A few years later, you know, even before I became a Christian, I had the, uh, the urge, I guess, the best way to, to be in the ministry. But I was not a Christian at the time. But that, after I became a Christian, the urge, the leading, the tendency became stronger and stronger. Uh, Bob and I served <coughs> nine years with Campus Crusade for Christ. Our ministry was with the lay, what was called the lay division. We would go into churches and help train uh, pastors and church members in evangelism, how to do personal evangelism and discipleship. Nine years. In 1960, uh, seven, 1976, uh, the Lord opened the door for us to come to Birmingham to serve with Shades Mountain Independent Church. I was assistant pastor under Dick Vignell for 20 years. His successor, Harry Walls, I was assistant for three years, and in the present pastor, Rick Gertson, for three years. I retired three times <laughs> from uh, Shades Mountain Independent. In other, other times, I have served at First Baptist Church of Birmingham as a, one of the staff members. Uh, I pastored my home churches, the Little Baptist and Presbyterian Church down in Sumter County for a period of time. And it seems the Lord is not through with me yet, even though I'm retired. I treasure the opportunities to, to help to preach in churches that may need my help, like Oak Grove Baptist. So that's a little of our story. Barbara and I have uh, three grown children, a daughter-in-law, a son-in-law, and three grandchildren. And most of them live in the area. So that's, that's a little bit of our story. That's so you will, may know a little bit better who we are. This morning, I'm going to talk to you on the subject, how to live 
a consistent Christian life. Part one. And next Sunday, un unless Richard, I mean, uh, Jim is able to come back, which I doubt, not with the lung issues that he's dealing with, but next week, how to live the Christian life in the power of the Holy Spirit. But today, how to live a, a consistent Christian life. I noticed that <clears throat> the Alabama State Fair was here, was it this past week or the week before? How many have you ever ridden on a roller coaster? Come on. <laughs> Most of you. I'm like the caterpillar looking up at the butterfly and said, you'll never get me up in one of those things. <laughs> but that's, I no, I don't ride roller coasters. I just, I watch them on television and I said, that's crazy. Zoom up and down and around. <laughs> that just doesn't look like fun to me. But some some people enjoy it. Unfortunately, many Christians live on a spiritual roller coaster. They go to church on a Sunday morning, they hear a good message, and they're on a spiritual high. And come Monday, they go to work, and there's that ornery brother, sister, employee, there's the boss that's demanding, there's the challenges that life comes, and so down they go. Maybe Wednesday night prayer meeting, have a wonderful prayer time, good fellowship, and here they up again on a high, spiritually, spiritual high. Monday morning comes again down, and so many Christians are like that, living on spiritual highs and spiritual lows. Brothers and sisters, it doesn't have to be that way. I want to talk to you today about living a consistent, staying, getting off and staying off that spiritual roller coaster experience. So I've used the word consistent, how to live a consistent Christian life. Now, that doesn't mean perfect. So get that out of your mind, okay? <laughs> Doesn't mean a perfect Christian. None of us are. One day, praise God, we'll be with him and everything will be perfect. But I use the word consistent simply means this constantly adhering to certain principles of God's word, living and adh always adhering to the principles of God's word. It means fixed or firm. Consistent means steady. Consistent means unchanging. Consistent means un not deviating, staying the course. Um, turn with me to Psalm 112. This is a men, this is a great passage of scripture, especially for men, but ladies, you too. I've taught this in a men's group. You know, we've got Proverbs 31 for the woman of God. Here we have the man of God. And look at verse Psalm 112, verse 5. It is well with the man who is gracious and lends. He will maintain his cause in judgment. He will never be shaken. The righteous will be remembered forever. Look at verse 7. He will not fear bad news, evil tidings. He will not fear bad news. His heart is, look at the word, steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is upheld. He will not fear until he looks with satisfaction on his adversaries. His heart is steadfast, trusting the Lord. Steadfast, unwavering, consistent, always believing and adhering to the principles of God's Word. And I think, brothers and sisters, in all of us, no exceptions, in my heart, Barbara, for you, in your heart of hearts, you want to live a consistent Christian life. You're tired of this roller coaster, up and down, emotional roller coaster that so many Christians live on. <clears throat> you 
You want to be steady, fixed, trusting the Lord. I want to try to explain uh, the how-to, how to live a consistent Christian life in my message today and next week. Uh, I love a how-to. Bill Bright, Dr. Bill Bright that we started with for nine years was a wonderful godly man teaching the how-tos of, of being a Christian. Now, I know the Bible has history. It's got doctrine. It's got poetry. But I believe the bottom line, the Bible instructs us how to live, how to live lives pleasing to the Lord, honoring him, worshiping, serving, glorifying him, and helping others to do the same. I like the how-tos. So today is a how-to message. Now, it's been said <clears throat> of John 3.16, all of you know that verse. It's been said of John 3.16, that it's the gospel in a nutshell. You've probably heard it said because it speaks of God's love, the gift of Jesus Christ for our salvation, and those who believe in him will not go to hell but will have eternal life. So the gospel in a nutshell. <clears throat> what if there was a single verse of scripture. Now I'm not trying to put God in a box. Don't misunderstand. God is bigger than a box and bigger than uh, so I'm not limiting God in any way. Please misun don't misunderstand. But what if there was a single verse of scripture that contains how to live the Christian life in a nutshell? Would you be interested? How about it? Would you be interested if you knew a verse like you know John 3.16 for salvation, what if there was a verse of scripture that would help you to go from there living a consistent Christian life? Get off of that spiritual roller coaster. I want to take you to that verse. Still in the book of Psalms, chapter 119. Chapter 119. It's a long chapter, the longest in the Bible. I want to begin at verse 129. So 119, verse chapter 120, uh, verse 129. Your testimonies are wonderful. Now keep in mind, again, this is not a psalm of David. Maybe Moses, maybe Asaph, uh, David's music man. We're not real sure, but it's a prayer. You, as you read it, it's obvious that the writer is simply recording his prayer. Your testimonies are wonderful. Therefore, my soul observes them. The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. I open my mouth wide and panted, for I long for your commandments. Turn to me and be gracious to me. What a wonderful prayer. You, after your, the manner with those who love your name, establish my footsteps in your word and do not let any iniquity have dominion over me. Redeem me from the oppression of man that I may keep your precepts. <clears throat> Make your face shine upon your servant. Teach me your statutes. My eyes shed streams of water because they do not keep your law. Now, the verse that I'm going to be pointing you to is in this section. I first became aware of this verse years ago when I first came to Shades Mountain Independent Church. I led a men's discipleship group, and in our Bible study, we came across the verse that I want to point you to. Since then, this has become I used to hear people talk, my life verse is, and I didn't have one, but I do <laughs> now because this verse is so ministered to me and, uh, for so many years. It's a psalmist prayer. It has become part of my life, especially my prayer life. I asked Barbara, we pray together almost every day, and she has heard me use this verse as a part of my prayer many, many, many times. 
and it's helped me to live the, the Christian life consistently. Not perfectly, but consistently. The key verse, 133, look at it. Now, I read it from the New American Standard. When I first memorized the verse, it was from King James. Now keep in mind, this verse is a part of a prayer. And any time you pray God's word back to him, you know you're praying according to his will. And John says if we ask according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request we desire of him, 1 John 5, 14 and 15. So it's a prayer. And I learned to pray. Quote, I, I memorized this verse in the King James, and that's the way I pray it. Lord, order my steps according to your word, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. Three distinct parts of this, of this verse. First, the first principle is this. Now keep in mind, we're take this verse ap applying in our life to live consistently for the Lord. Lord, order my steps. Now what am I saying when I say that? That's a prayer of surrender. Now we're talking about Christians who know they've received Christ, they know Christ is in their life, they know they're born again, they know they have the gift of eternal life that when this life is over, they're going to heaven. But in the meantime, in the nasty now and now, we begin by saying, Lord, I surrender. I surrender. I yield my life to you. That's the first part. Order my steps. When I pray this, I'm surrendering. I'm asking the Lord to control my life, to direct my steps. Uh, the New American Standard says, establish my steps in your word. So the first part then is a prayer of surrender, asking the Lord to control, to be in charge, to direct your life. After all, <clears throat> don't we call him Lord Jesus, don't we? Lord is not a part of his name. That's his position of authority. So if we say Lord Jesus, we are acknowledging he is Lord over me, over my life. <clears throat> After all, oh Jesus said, why do you call me Lord and do not do the things that I say? So when we call him Lord, that implies Obedience, obedience to his word. Um, <clears throat> hold your place there and go to Psalm 17, verse 5. Psalm 17, verse 5. Love it. My steps have held fast to your path. My feet have not slipped. That's what it means to surrender to the Lord, to follow his word. So now the word steps, order my steps. The word steps, whether it's in 133 or the verse we've just read, or go, you go into the New Testament, the word steps is simply a word referring to the way we live, our lives. Moment by moment, by day, by day, by week, by week, by year, for all of our lives. So, so when we say, <coughs> order my steps, we are surrendering to the Lord for every moment of every day. Lord, order my steps, direct my life, lead me in the way that you want me to go. That's what we're praying. Who's in control of your life? Who? Well, you may say, well, I guess I am. My wife or my husband. <laughs> Maybe somebody else. I don't know. 
Who's in control of your life? Now, let me ask you a question. Seriously, and I think about it. Who knows what's best for your life? Who knows what's best? Who knows what's right? If you say, well, the Lord does. I agree. He does. Well, let's support that. We say God is sovereign. I think you, you here at Oak Grove Baptist Church believe that God is sovereign. He rules over the lives of men and nations. He's sovereign. He's in control. The earth is the Lord's, psalmist says, and everything in it. He is sovereign. He is also has all power. I love Dr. Stanley, and I listened to a message. <laughs> uh, he spoke on God's faithfulness and goes through all of the attributes of God. Very really wonderful. He has all power and all knowledge. He's everywhere present. So when we say he is Lord, I'm believing all that God is. His sovereignty, his power, his knowledge, his presence, his grace, his love, his mercy, his faithfulness, the whole thing. Last week, I quoted for you two verses. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4. If you didn't write it down last week, you need to. This is a song of Moses. Fred read earlier Psalm 90, which is a prayer of Moses. Here's the song of Moses. Look at verse 4. It says, the rock. Now, my translation, yours may say, he is the rock. Mine says, the rock as if nothing more needs to be said. <laughs> We're talking about foundation. He's the rock. Look at the next phrase. His work is perfect. His work in your life, in my life, is perfect. All his ways uh, are just a God of faithfulness and without injustice. Can you trust a God like that? Can you? Whose work is, he's the rock, a firm foundation. His work is perfect. Not only in the world, but in your life and in my life. His work is perfect. All right, go back to Psalm 119, 145. Write that reference down. I'm sorry, I got it wrong. Psalm, Psalm 145, verse 17. Psalm 145, verse 17. Let's look at that. Are you there? Are you there? What does it say? The Lord is righteous. You say, yeah, yeah, I believe that. The Lord is righteous in all of his ways. That is, he is right in all of his ways, including what he does in your life and in my life. He is righteous in all of his ways. And look at the next phrase. And holy, we sang about that today, didn't we, Richard? Holy, holy, holy. Someone has said all of the attributes of God could be included in that word. He is holy. But he is holy in all of his deeds, everything that he does. Not only is he holy in his attribute, he's holy in everything that he does, including what he does in your life and mine. So, Back to Psalm 119. <clears throat> the Lord is righteous in all of his ways, ho holy in all of his works. Are you? 
Are you righteous in all of your ways and holy? In all? Of course not. Of course not. But he is. Now, Scripture says, now we're talking about the Lord who is the rock. His work is perfect. We're talking about the Lord who is righteous in all of his ways and holy in all of his works. Scripture says we are in his hands. In the hands of the Father and the Son. The scripture also says, 1 Corinthians 6, we're not our own. You don't belong to yourself. You, are, As a believer, you're not free to do as you please. Now you can, but you'll pay the consequences. We are not our own. We have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. So, I, wanna, I heard a story once of a man who bought a Model T Ford. I don't know how many years ago that was, but there was not a service station on every corner, and mechanics were not readily available, but he was driving it one day, and it quit. It quit the engine simply quit running. And so there was stuck out on a country road. A little bit later, a second Model T Ford comes along, sees the man in distress, and he gets the man in the second one gets out and offers to the first man, can I help you? And the first man explains, well, it, the engine it just quit. The second man said, well, maybe I can help you. See, he goes up, opens the hood, tinkers with the engine. He says, now try it. It cranks, and he's ready to go. The first man says, how, do you, how did you know how to fix that? The second man says, let me inter introduce myself. I'm Henry Ford. Now, why do I tell that story? Because Henry Ford designed and built that car. He knows how it works, and he can fix it when it's broken. God is like that in us. He designed us in heaven. He created us. He placed us here for his purpose. He knows what's best, and so when we give our lives to him, he orders our steps. The second phrase, by the way, by the way, I'm going to ask, and this, I don't mean this to sound harsh, but the first principle is if you are to live the Christian life consistently, you must surrender yourself fully to the Lord. My question is this, and I ask myself the same question. Are you too selfish to do that? Because that's what gets in the way. Our old self gets in the way. I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. You can't as a Christian. Okay. Second principle. Go back to 119, 133. Establish my footsteps. What's the next phrase? In your word. Or King James says, according to your word. I said earlier that living consistent is adhering to a set of principles. And for the Christian, it's God's word. <laughs> if I surrender my life to the Lord so that he directs my steps, that requires that I know what he wants me to do. And how do you, how do you communicate with the Lord? Well, we say he speaks to me primarily through his word, and I talk to him in prayer. Okay, that's, that's the personal relationship that we have with God. It, so when I say, order my steps according to that, that means I've got to know what this book says. I need to know it. And how do I do that? By, by hearing it, like you're hearing this morning. Hearing it, reading it, studying it. Memorizing it <laughs> and meditating. There he is. 
Oh, my goodness. My grandmother, I wanted to be outside with my brother playing ball on Sunday afternoon. She says, no, sir, you're coming in to memorize scripture. And she had a little basket with verses of scripture on cards. And we would have to reach in and get out a card and memorize that verse. I'm so glad she did that. <laughs> because once it's memorized, then you can meditate. What does it mean? You think about it. You think about it. You chew on it. You turn it over and over in your mind. You think about it. You meditate on it. I grew up on a farm. We had cattle. And I've often seen these cows chewing their cud. Now, Brother Jim may have used this illustration with you. You know, a cow has five stomachs, and it chews its cud and it swallow it and it's nourished by that first chewing, swallow it later. I've seen them do it. They bring that cud, that ball of grass or whatever they're eating, and they chew on it some more. They chew on it some more, and they nourish by a different digestive juice. They swallow it and maybe bring it up again. They chew on it again. That's meditating, chewing on the word, thinking about it long and hard, turning it over and over. That's how you hide it in your heart. And what's the promise? So that I might not sin against thee. So that's meditation. So we do follow the Lord by hiding it in our heart so that my mind and the things that I think about have been transformed by the word of God, Romans 12, 2. Transformed by the, by the renewing of our mind. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet. All of my steps according to your word. Your word is a lamp to my feet, shows where I'm standing, but it's a light to my path to show where I'm going. We need to know the word. A few weeks ago, our pastor stood in the pulpit. He's a man of the word, so grateful. He stood in the pulpit one day and loudly said, this is God's word, read it. <laughs> now, he's not always quite that loud, and, but it's a, you know, it's a shame that Christians have to be so strongly exhorted to read the word. If you desire to live a consistent Christian life, brothers and sisters, this is God's word. Read it. Read it. Read it. Re you say, well, I don't understand it. You keep reading, and God will, Holy Spirit will lead you into truth. Now, Barbara and I have both been on reading through the Bible every year. She's on one plan. I'm on a different one. Barbara is in her 30th year of reading through the Bible every year. Now, I'm slower than that. <laughs> Cut that in half, and um, you'll be about right for me. I've got mine right here. I keep it, and I mark it every day that I read. So I, I, I exhort you. Read the Bible. Whether you're in a reading plan, you need to feed on it every day. You must get God's word into your heart and your mind. Finally, let's look at the third principle of 119, 133. And do not let any iniquity have dominion over me. Iniquity is simply another word for sin. You know, it would be a simple matter to live the Christian life if we didn't have opposition. Oh, it would be heaven, <laughs> and one day, <laughs> one day it will. But right now, we're imperfect people living in an imperfect world. We have opposition. I thought, what if a football team didn't have opposition? They'd make a touchdown at every play, <laughs> and Alabama almost did that. But there's opposition to us in the Christian life. It's testing. Makes us stronger helps us to know if we really believe God's word or not. Now, we have three enemies. The world, that's this sinful place that we live. The world or the world system, the things that are in the world. The flesh, 
Even after we become Christians, that part of us that still loves to sin, that selfish, that old nature. I wish God, I wish it had been taken away when I became a Christian, but it didn't. It's still there, and you too, you still have that old nature. But we're told to surrender it to the Lord. That's what I'm talking about. So we have the world, the flesh, and we have the devil, a uh, uh, great enemy of our souls, who's like a roaring lion. He wants to kill you. He wants to destroy, to dis distract, to discourage you. The world, the things that are in the world, that's the temptation. Then we have the flesh, that's the tempted. And then we have Satan, who is the tempter. The temptation, the tempted, and it's a conspiracy. It's a conspiracy. Those three at work together. To lead us astray. To lead us to a life of disobedience, of dishonoring to the Lord. We have we are no match for them. We cannot resist in our own power. In our own will. I'm going to live the Christian life if it kills me, and it doesn't work that way. We, 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 we need help. Therefore, we, as the psalmist, Lord, let not any iniquity have dominion over me. We place it in the Lord's hands. Psalm 28, verse 7. Write that verse down. Psalm 28, verse 7 says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and I am helped. Therefore, with my heart will I rejoice, and with my lips I will praise him. We cannot resist in our own strength, but God gives us strength. And next week, I'm going to talk about the place of the Holy Spirit in enabling us to live the Christian life. So, as, let me conclude. To live a, a consistent Christian life, first I must surrender to the Lord. Okay? Second, I must know the Word. I must know the word. And three, I must trust him to help me from sin. So my challenge to you. Okay, listen up. I'm not through. <laughs> Almost. My challenge is this. Before you come next Sunday and start tomorrow morning, I want you to memorize. <laughs> There's that ugly word, but it's important. I want you to memorize Psalm 119, 133. And whatever translation you're accustomed to, I want you to memorize it. Do that in the morning, and I want you to repeat it to yourself every day, meditate, and even pray, start praying that verse. Lord, today, as I go to work, as I'm retired, and whatever it is, in your, in your life, Lord, order my steps today. I surrender my life to you according to your word, Lord. Teach me, show me. Your, your word is a, a light, a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. Show me. And Lord, as I face the world, Lord, I need help that it, sin does not have dominion over me. Memorize it, meditate on it, and pray those verses on a regular day and next Sunday I'm going to talk about the place the person and ministry of the Holy Spirit not only in directing our steps but to give us the power to live the Christian life